Welcome, everyone. My guest today is Managing Editor James Kleiman to talk about the commission lawsuits and how the defendants could adopt strategies from the plaintiff's lawyer to win in the next round. James, welcome back to the podcast. Good to be back. It's only been, what, two days? Yesterday? I, two days? I don't know how long ago this was. It's great to talk to you so often. You guys are doing so many great things in the newsroom. Um, today, we're going to be talking about something that's definitely in the news, but it's not necessarily a specific news item. And that's just sort of talking about an update on the on the commission lawsuits, right, which have been dominating our news page and others for a couple of months now. Um, and I, I don't know that there's a lot of new developments, but there's a lot of new things uh, people are talking about. And so that's kind of what I wanted to, to bring up with you. Anthony Lamacchia, obviously, um, somebody a lot of people in the industry and uh, in the real estate side kind of look to. He he recently um, actually got a call from the plaintiff's lawyer, uh, Ketchmark. So kind of catch me up on that. So uh, apparently Michael Ketchmark told him that uh, he's doing a great job and uh, he appreciates the advocacy work that, that Anthony Lamacchia is doing. Obviously, they disagree on some pretty significant issues related to the real estate commission uh, fight, I guess you could call it. And, um, you know, he, he provided Anthony his side of the story as to why he's no longer at a, a speaking event. And, um, you know, they, they kind of renewed their, I guess, talks about talking more. I, I don't know how else to say it. There's just, uh, there's a lot of feedback, right? So it's a bit of a feedback loop, but but certainly they're both very committed to the positions that they have. And I know that Anthony said that he believes the, uh, you know, that the case isn't really on the solid foundation in the sense that if you look at the parties who filed the suit, Sitzer Burnett, one of the parties dropped out and he took issue with the way the suit was formulated and questioned whether Michael Ketchmark self-funded it or it was another party out there who is providing ammunition to take down the, the real estate industry. Uh, Michael Ketchmark, he says, denied that and said it was entirely self-funded. And, and look, Michael Ketchmark is a wealthy man. He's a very high powered lobbyist in the state of Missouri. He's won a number of very significant class action lawsuits in, in the billions of dollars. Of course, he doesn't get all of that money, but he gets a significant portion. Michael Ketchmark is doing quite well. I think if he wanted to fund a lawsuit like this on his own without outside sources, he could absolutely do it. And he says he did it. I have no reason to believe that he didn't. Uh, and there were also questions that Anthony Lamaki had related to re really the, the plaintiffs themselves and whether they made money on uh, questioning the the state of their supposed injury related to the commissions, right? I think we've talked about this before, Sarah. In the vast majority of cases, sellers are buyers and they benefit from the same system that apparently is is so dangerous and and so anti-consumer and, and a violation of the antitrust law. So that was a teaser. Anthony Lamacchia said that he would come back next week and, you know, dish the dirt and, uh, you know, break down how much money they made on these sales, how much they paid in commissions, whether they came out ahead, et cetera. Well, and he's going to be on, um, Anthony Lamacchia will be on Real Trending Podcast, our sister podcast uh, next week. So it'll be interesting. But I really wanted to talk to you about it because I felt like, you know, you you covered the trial in person. I was there just for the last couple of days, but it was there for the verdict and all of that. And I think that some of the things that Lamacchia said really resonated with me about Ketchmark's ability to talk to the jury and, you know, he was very, um, he, he didn't want to call out, you know, the, the uh, defendant side too much. I can understand that. And, and just to be clear, I mean, you and I do not have a horse in this race. Uh, we, we want to remain uh, unbiased, but at the same time, it, to me, it was obvious that Ketchmark, the plaintiff's attorney, really resonated with the jury in a way that the defendant's attorneys, at least when I was there for the short time I was there, did not. And and so I kind of wanted to dig into that because that's what he talked about a little bit. And if you weren't there, I think it's hard to understand what that felt like in the courtroom. So I wanted to ask you what what your observations were. I think there's something to it. I was in, in the courtroom for over a week and 
my human impression of how warm you feel, how what, what sort of connection you have to the attorneys is important, right? You are sitting in a courtroom. You don't have your cell phone. You don't have your laptop. You don't have people to chat with. There aren't a lot of distractions, uh, but it is easy to let your mind wander and to not be fully engaged. And the lawyers, there were so many lawyers in the courtroom, they were obviously uh, maybe a little bit more engaged in some elements of testimony than I think non-legal <laughs> community members are because it's it's so much stop and go and it's so much procedure. It is very, very laborious, I guess, to keep up and, and to be fully with it. And if someone comes along and they're charming, they're charismatic, they're friendly, they're funny, they, they keep things lively. I think it provides uh, maybe a little bit more enjoyment, a little bit more color. It keeps you more interested. And I think we're, we're humans. We, we have emotions and we feel a stronger connection to people who are like that than others, you know, and, and that's just human nature. And, and there's a reason that trial attorneys are showmen in a lot of respects. They are trying to sway regular people who come from, in most cases, you know, different walks of life, but they're not talking to other trial attorneys. They're not talking to people who run large organizations. They're not trying to sway even the judge in some respects. Obviously, they need the judge to side with them on, on some procedural matters and, you know, take their arguments into account. But they're there to convince eight jurors, in, in the case of Sitzer Burnett, that they had been injured by this practice and that these big, bad real estate entities have conspired to make them pay more money when they sell their house. And I think that's one, a difficult position to defend against because you are defending um, corporations and, and you could see they have these big boards up and it'll have the various LLCs and entities and the NAR and, and some of the brokerages, some of their arguments were, look, like this isn't how real estate structures work that Gary Keller has nothing to do with what the agent on the ground decides the commission should be. And, and they're, they're making a legalistic argument, one that I think is absolutely correct, and that Gary Keller on a fundamental level is not telling the everyday agent what their commission should be. But the NAR and the brokerages, I think we're very by the book and very committed to arguing the law. <laughs> and Again, as someone who covers the real estate industry for a living, who's done this for about a decade, I I felt that their arguments were more persuasive on a legal front. I didn't see a conspiracy in a proper sense. My interpretation, and we've talked about this before, is that each of the stakeholders has their own series of incentives for pushing commissions or stabilizing commissions. But causality doesn't necessarily, a, a casual relationship doesn't mean that they've all gotten together in a smoke filled room and said, you know, hey, we're going to, we're going to make sure that everybody's getting 3%, right? But the jury, I felt, seemed more engaged when Michael Ketchmark spoke and they seemed a little bit more interested in hearing some of his rebuttals and some of the the arguments about how, you know, Gary Keller or someone would would say, when I was an agent, here's what I here's what I fought for. And I always fought for six percent and I would never lower my commission because I'm a, a true professional and I know my value. And the brokerages would argue like, yeah, he's saying that as an agent. He's not telling them that that's what they should do. But I think it was pretty damning from an emotional standpoint. And he was really good at, at providing color and, and funny quips and seeming personable and a guy you want to get a beer with, right? It all kind of goes back to how did George W. Bush get elected? Well, forgetting the Supreme Court and all that, but 
you know, just the idea that this is a guy you want to get a beer with, right? And and I think in a jury case, it's totally different than trying to argue in front of a judge who is more likely to be on your side if it's purely a legal matter. And of course, it should be purely a legal matter, but that's not how a citizen-based juror system works. And they know this. The NAR knows this. The brokerages know this. They took a big risk going in with the legal strategy they did. And two and a half hours, it took a jury to determine that they were um, they were liable for breaking anti federal antitrust law. You know, that's it, it's hard to argue that they they got it right. And it was about halfway through the two and a half hours where the jury came back and asked for a form about damages, the damages worksheet. So it yeah. didn't even, they were, the last part of that is just them deciding how much they wanted the damages to be. So it didn't even take them more than an hour and a half to come up with like, oh no, this is a conspiracy. Um, and, and the reason we're talking about it is because of what Lamakia brought up that I, that I resonated with, which is Ketchmark. Uh, you know, he, like he used words like cartel. He he talked about the real estate cartel, which to me was laughable and ridiculous in all of the things I can think about in this country that might be wrong and might be a cartel. And this, this, you know, paying your buyer agent, you know, the seller uh, paying the buyer agent, which I've done, you know, multiple times being some sort of, you know, dark backroom thing was just, you know, uh, not persuasive to me, but it was obviously very persuasive to those jurors. And if the industry wants to fight back on this, they're going to have to come up with a better strategy next time. And it has to be about value proposition. I think a lot of the jurors, and I'm not inside their heads, the the jurors asked the judge not to be made available for media questions. They didn't want to discuss the case after it ended, but it's pretty likely that some of them are homeowners and were probably home sellers at some point and paid five or six percent and thought back to their own experience. And even if they did like their realtor, thought to themselves, you know, maybe that was a bit too much. I don't think that was good value. And it's interesting because when, when you look at the surveys, a lot of people believe that their agent did a good job and they were happy with the performance of their agent, but don't necessarily have a great deal of respect for the industry at large. And so there are, of course, in every industry, a couple bad actors. I don't know how many there are in real estate. I, I do think that there are probably too many that do f some level of activity and Really, it's too easy to get a license. It's too easy to, you know, maintain um, having your, your license at a brokerage. And I, I think the standards should be much higher than they are personally. That's that's how I feel about it. Maybe one or two of them worked with an agent that took a bunch of their money and didn't do a very good job, right? That's very possible. And the reality is when you use terms like cartel, when you use the word conspiracy, people react to that. People feel very strongly about those words because the imagery, the the associations with those words are pretty negative. You know, no, nobody is the victim of a conspiracy in which they get uh, a pizza party and uh, a free day at, a, at an amusement park. You know, like if that were a conspiracy, people associated strongly with that. I, I think maybe things would have gone a little bit differently for the NAR, but the way the NAR approached the case was you know, basically they have these high powered defense attorneys from DC and they march into a place they've probably never been or haven't spent much time there. Don't know the people of Missouri and come in there with their expensive briefcases and, and nice suits. And they try to argue the case on the merits of the case, but not arguing based on what the jury would resonate with. And, and I think that was a flaw uh, in retrospect. You know, again, at the time I, I thought, hmm, this could go either way, but I think the argument that there is no conspiracy is stronger than the one that there is a conspiracy, but that's the risk you take. And if you don't play to the emotions, if you don't try to get them on your side, if you don't prove that the real estate agent in America makes $50,000 a year, 
and, you know, struggles and they're single moms in your community. They are senior citizens who go to church with your your family. They're in your community. I don't think they did a very good job of articulating that this is sort of the quintessential American profession, one that doesn't have a huge amount of barriers to entry for better and for worse, right? Um, but there's another side of the argument that there are, you know, too many real estate agents and that it's too easy to become one, which is this is the American dream personified. And it benefits people to realize the American dream of home ownership, right? And and I just don't think they did a very good job of, of articulating that argument, that emotional argument. I could not agree more. I think that is such a great point that, you know, the American dream, we, we really didn't see that much. Um, I, I, like you, thought on the merits of the argument that um, it could go either way, but I was swayed more to the defendants and because I just didn't feel like they had proven it. Of course, I wasn't in the courtroom the whole time, but for the closing arguments, I felt like their their argument was better. But I do think they're at also a natural disadvantage when you have like four or five attorneys on one side and one on the other. So every time Catchmark, the plaintiff's yep. attorney gets up, he can reconnect with them like it's the same guy. And he's really, you know, really, uh, you know, talking to them in this like folksy way. And then you've got these other corporate attorneys. And every time they get up, they've had like one fifth the amount of time because there's five of them, there's four of them. It's hard to keep track of which ones they are and who they're representing. And um, and so I think that's that's also part of it. But I think you just nailed it. I was surprised that we didn't hear more from, you know, actual agents, buyers, agents. I, I was sitting with one in the in the gallery and, you know, he focuses on first time homeowners who really need some, an agent like him to even steer them to the kind of programs that they're going to be able to qualify for a mortgage. Like if they don't have him, like they're probably going to get shut out pretty early in the process or not even make it. Why not? Why didn't they have someone like him on? They, they did have a couple more everyday folks, but there weren't many of them and their testimony was fairly short. But, uh, you know, they also tried to connect the jury with some of the executives like Gina Blafari and Gary Keller. They want them to tell their life story, how they got into real estate. And, and as you know, so few people aspire to be real estate agents or managing brokers or running a, you know, a, a brokerage owned by a conglomerate like Berkshire Hathaway, right? It's never what somebody sets out to do, but, but I, I do think it, it attracts people and, and you can have some very entrepreneurial, very interesting stories that come out of there. And, and in a lot of cases, it's because they really do not just, they want to make money. Of course, they want to have a, a good, uh, you know, life and, and financial freedom and all that, but they also do like helping people. And it is a very personal relationship that they build with clients. And the way you succeed as a realtor is by doing repeat business and referral business. And you can't be, you can't be, you know, a, a what is it? A dead fish or a cold fish or whatever that you can't be a fish, cold fish. Cold fish. Yeah. yeah. You can't be a dead or a cold <laughs> fish as a, a realtor and, and succeed. Um, because it is, it is a job that requires charm and finesse and agility and, and really being committed to helping the client in the end. And that's how you get referral business. That's how you get repeat business. And so to me, like the essence of what it is to be a realtor seemed very much in contrast to the legal strategy, which was, you know, articulated and argued by high powered antitrust attorneys from DC who maybe again in a controlled environment in a DC courtroom with people who are not, you know, HVAC repair techs in Kansas city, Missouri, probably fare better, but they're, arguing, you know, on, on Michael Ketchmark's home turf. And as you said, they don't have the advantage of going out at him one-on-one, -on -one, right? They're splintered in a sense. And that's not their fault. That's how the case was brought. And, and each defendant needs to defend themselves in, individually needs to defend themselves. So they can't have the NAR attorney defending Keller Williams in a, in a proper way. And, and, a lot of the testimony was Keller Williams and Home Services America saying we basically have nothing to do with the NAR, and and you know at one point they had um, they had someone from Keller Williams and, and they asked about why you know the the larger company did or did not support one of their agents for becoming a, a hotshot at the NAR, maybe president even a couple of years ago, 
And they were basically like, well, we think that that really detracts from what they can do with us. And we don't see that as a big advantage. So we're not really going to throw any support behind this candidate, which really upset the candidate. And I thought that was very telling. I thought that was very illuminating that the brokerages themselves at a high level don't really work with the NAR. It is very much a grassroots kind of organization in some respects. And, and those who participate do so at at a very lower level than a Gary Keller, a Gino Blafari. And if they do it well, if they're able to work through the, the insane levels of bureaucracy and manage to ascend all the way to the top, they can do very well for themselves. And, and it can be very, um, you know, very worthwhile. But I mean, the average realtor who's even on their, you know, board, it's like 800 something people. The vast majority of them have no idea what's going on at the NAR don't care all that much, I think, and are just kind of there to vote here and there and, and uh, you know, rubber stamp a lot of stuff. So that to me was one of the, you know, things that I found most compelling is that uh, if you're in the jury, I mean, it's obvious, like, how is it a cartel? <laughs> It's a pretty loosely organized cartel. If if the people there are like, you know, most of the agents don't even, you know, may not, maybe they're a member, but that's, that's kind of it. Just, you know, I mean, it's not like, oh, they're the, you know, they're the people pulling the strings of the puppets all over the country. It's like, mm, I don't know. Have you met any realtors? They're kind of a, a, a very independent entrepreneurial bunch. They're not really easily manipulated. But it is the stickiness of the commissions that I think really did, um, really did push a lot of the jurors to think there's something going on here. It seems at best odd that this industry that has experienced so much technological change and all of these advancements and the consumer revolution with the internet, all that hasn't changed at all, really, on a granular level. Maybe it'll change a little bit in an extreme year like 2008, 2009, right? Or, you know, during certain booms. But I think Michael Ketchmark also did a really strong job of articulating some of the realtor education and and intimating that it is essentially a self-policing industry and that is the reason that commissions are high and and that may be true that may absolutely be the case you, it's not often that you see people taking much lower commissions. I mean, some will negotiate and we put out a survey pretty recently that found, you know, uh, I think it was around 60% do negotiate their commissions on some level, but you don't see someone going from a 3% on their side to a 1%. You know, you don't see people cutting what we use in the, in the mortgage business, like BIPs, you know, a hundred basis points off their commission, you know, 1%, right? It just doesn't happen. So there, there is a lot of stickiness and, it seems to be geographically correlated. You know, you just don't see a lot of variability in in areas over the course of decades, right? Decades. And so while stockbrokers and other you know, commission-based businesses have been radically changed by the speed and the accessibility of the internet and the amount of information that the consumer now has, um, it, it hasn't translated into lower commissions. Now, there are discount brokerages out there. There are other models out there. They've never taken hold. I think the plaintiffs would argue, not that this came up in the case, that that's because the realtor lobby has worked to stifle them, to suppress any innovation, to self-police any bad actors out there who are trying to charge lower commissions than the, the market and, you know, the reality is the consumer does have a choice. They choose not to work with those discount brokerages on average. And I think that's because most people only do this a couple times in their life, right? They only buy or sell a home a couple times. And you don't want to take a risk thinking, well, if I go with a discount broker, I'm not going to get the same level of service. And that could mean I'm leaving money on the table so they don't do it. Uh, that argument didn't really come up all that much during trial, but there are other models out there. The NAR, I think, didn't do a great job of explaining how many different models there are in real estate. They didn't talk about some of the structural complexities. They didn't get into like downlining or, you know, anything related to the market centers and how 
how that works. Um, I'm not sure that that would help the cause necessarily, but, but I guess my point is like, there are so many variables and maybe there is in the education, um, you know, certainly the suggestion that realtors maintain their commissions. And we did see that come up in trial, but I don't think that there is any smoking gun. I don't think you can prove that there is a definitive conspiracy among, you know, 1.6 billion people out there. It's just, you know, these markets haven't changed much and there's just a lot more scrutiny now than I think, you know, there used to be. I think that's really a great point. If there was a smoking gun, one of the things that Catchmark kept doing was like, this has been six years of my life. I've been working on this for six years, or, you know, which to me was just like histrionics. I was like, why do I care what you decided to put your life to? You know, like that's your choice, you know, and obviously it paid off for him in this case, but like, um, you know, again, I, I, I came back to like, it's not like the, you know, something, a class action lawsuit that's, you know, had killed people or strong injuries or whatever. So, but if there had been a smoking gun, you figure in six years of research and all of those hours, it would have come up, but there wasn't, there, there was nothing tying all these people together. There was no, not even a meeting between them. Um, you know, and, and the plaintiff's attorney was able to argue that, that like, it didn't have to be from the, from the letter of the law. It doesn't have to be, um, a coordinated conspiracy the way that we think about it. Uh, but, and the reason we're talking about this is not to be like, oh, you know, Monday morning quarterbacks on something that happened. It's like Ketchmark ha filed that same day, all these other, um, lawsuits and you have this wave of copycat lawsuits. Everyone's going to be, all of those lawyers, plaintiffs are going to, plaintiffs lawyers are going to be looking at Ketchmark going, taking a page from him. Here's how he did it. So to me, this is very, um, valuable to think about what what each side did well and what each side could, could maybe do better. And I think it's almost certain that they're going to be taking stock in the decisions they made on their legal strategy. Again, like I, I think they probably had the letter of the law absolutely right. And I, I think, you know, you, you try it again with uh, a, a panel of judges instead of eight jurors and the inner probably, you know, is, is done and dusted in two and a half hours winning and, and having drinks at the bar down the street, you know, and, and taking a victory lap, but these are going to be jury cases if they get there. And all of the parties have added legal firepower. They've brought in very powerful lawyers who have argued in front of the Supreme Court and who are very well versed in antitrust law. I have to think that the NAR's attorneys, the first go around, were very well versed in antitrust law, but the jury didn't care. <laughs> you know, the jury didn't maybe not didn't care, but it didn't seem to make the difference in that case. And so, yeah, I, I think they maybe need to do a little bit more homework, maybe better understand some of the, uh, you know, the people that are in these jury pools and, and what kind of argument, maybe do more jury testing, maybe, you know, start, start examining what didn't work and, and where can they improve? But if they take the same legal strategy, the next time, it very well could be the same result, and they really can't afford that. They really can't. Well, I know we're we're looking at this, um, you know, all of this happening from different angles. We've got virtual events on it. Um, we're having people speak on it at our um, the gathering in April. You've gone to different, uh, you you know, you've flown out to different companies to talk about it. Um, we're continuing to report on it. So you know, everyone, check back, check it. Um, housingwire.com. We are going all in on this, but thanks for this conversation, James, because I think it really is interesting as we try to dissect what happened last time, what might happen next time. Yeah. And then just a very quick note for the listeners, there might be some movement on a pretty pivotal case tomorrow, which involves the NAR and the DOJ, not to regurgitate some some old, old issues on, on the legal front, but the DOJ sued had a settlement with the NAR to change some of their practices, some of which are related to commissions, uh, which should come as no surprise to people. And then the Biden administration comes in and they rip up the agreement. And, um, you know, so there's going to be a hearing on that tomorrow. So that should be very interesting. And we have, we don't have any obvious cases coming up in the next couple months, but we do know that there's going to be a final judgment coming up in Sitzer Burnett sometime in the spring, probably April, May, uh, injunctive relief, which will 
in effect determine cooperative compensation policies in the U.S. Uh, should be coming by May uh, at this point. I, I know it's a long time for people to be in limbo, but it is important to highlight the timeline. And then we also have a major case out of Illinois in Chicago called the Morrill case, which is very similar to the Sitzer Burnett case, almost exactly the same. And that'll be argued at some point in 2024. Usually, you know, at, at this point, if we don't have a trial date, it means it's at least six months out. So we're probably not looking until Q2, Q3. Um, but that that is a very, very big case. And that'll be the next battleground, most likely. James, thanks so much for um, being on, talking about it with me. And uh, we will talk to you again soon. Thanks very much. 